welcome everybody. Good to see you tonight. And uh, I think we are on target. We got the phone call from Mr. Ivan today, and Sunday school is going to be on this Sunday. We're looking forward to that. I think he's making a phone call out uh, Friday night. But uh, thanks to those of you who came and helped with the moving of the furniture and all. We appreciate that. And welcome to those of you that are joining us on Facebook and YouTube. We're always glad to have you here with us. And uh, to start off with tonight, our pastor of prayer here at Bethel, uh, DJ West, is going to come up and just give us a little report about what happened at the uh, National Day of Prayer here and give us any update we got on prayer. And then if you would, lead us in prayer. All right. Thank you, Brother Charlie. And uh, I'll join him in welcoming everyone here and also on YouTube or wherever you are. Uh, last Thursday was the National Day of Prayer. <clears throat> Excuse me. And we did have a group here. And um, the Lord surprises me all the time, which, you know, I'm, I'm pretty simple, so don't take much <laughs> to surprise me. But uh, I believe we had about 15 or 16 people here. I didn't count, but I was trying to recall in my mind. I think it was about 15 or 16 people we had, which was a great turnout in my opinion. And we had a, we had a good time of fellowship. Uh, that's one thing you'll find when you get into a prayer group. You learn uh, a lot about each other, and it gets personal, and it means more to each of you. And so, like I said, we had a good time of fellowship. There was a lot of sharing, and then we finished up with a, a time of prayer. And uh, I shared one thing with uh, the group that was here. To, to give you an idea of what prayer does and how God moves in our lives. Uh, Janie got saved, my wife Janie got saved three months before I did. And we were in Virginia Beach at the time I was in the military. We'd been there for almost five years and nobody had knocked on my door and said, I'm Joe Smith from the local Baptist church or Assembly of God or any other church. No one had, had spoke to us about it or witnessed to us. She got saved, I believe it was in September, I got saved in December, but between September and December, everywhere I turned, there were Christians, okay? And I don't mean pew warmers. <laughs> I mean sold out, you know, sold out soul winners. And maybe sometime I'll give my testimony and I'll share all that with you. But that was all because of the prayer that the church and my wife were doing, okay? God honors our prayers. Amen. And God answers our prayers. And it's so important <clears throat> And like I said, Charlie has asked me to be the prayer pastor here, and that's what I'm trying to do. Uh, and what I wanted to get through, the, through to everyone was, I don't, I don't get brownie points for doing this, okay? And if you get involved with a prayer group, you're going to find out that you're the one that's going to benefit from it. You're going to draw closer to people. You're going to draw closer to God, okay? And your prayers are just going to mean so much more when you've got somebody there with you that you get to know real well. So I asked you to... Consider it. There's still a sign-up list in the back. I've got uh, maybe four or five names on it. Uh, Janie and I are going to try to start our prayer group in the next week or so. I've got to contact the folks that I'm, I'm inviting to do it. Uh, we still need people to be uh, host for cottage prayer meetings. So if you're interested in that, uh, there's sign-up sheets still there. Just put your name on it, and I'll contact you. And uh, we'll see where, where God leads from there. But uh, just consider that, and like I said, you're going to be the one benefiting from it. God answers prayers, but you're going, to, you're going to be the one benefiting from it. So with all that said, let's pray. Father, I thank you, Lord, for the time uh, we have to come together. I thank you for the sunshine that we've seen today, Lord. Uh, I pray tonight, God, that you would just bless our pastor as he brings the word to us, Father. I pray, God, that you would open our hearts, calm our minds, Help us to just focus on what he has for us tonight, Lord. And, Father, through your Holy Spirit, our hearts will be touched, our minds will be touched. We would be able to receive what you would have for us to hear tonight. So, Father, we ask that you bless in everything that's done, and I pray that everything we do will bring glory and honor to you. And we ask it all in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, DJ. I want to join him and Pastor Charlie in welcoming you tonight. Uh, let's stand right now. We're going to sing When We All Get to Heaven.
Sorry, I know. I told you one, two, and four, and he played one, two, and three, so I was all confused. I didn't know what to tell you, to be honest. <laughs> um, well, we do have uh, a few visitors here tonight, so I want to let you know, uh, as you came in, we won't be passing plates tonight, we'll, but we do have an offering tithes box on the outside uh, of the sanctuary on the left as you go out. If you want to uh, participate in that, we surely appreciate it. And now we're going to sing Come Thou Fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious sonnet Sung by Thank you, Carter. You know, uh, we're going to be praying uh, again tonight, and uh, and I want to ask you, what was your sister's name again? Michelle. And uh, they, uh, Jim and Anna were just telling when they came in tonight that uh, she had been airlifted, uh, I think, to Johns Hopkins and uh, didn't know if she was going to make it through the day, and they have not heard anything tonight, but... Uh, guys, let's be praying for Michelle and for Jim and Anna. I'm going to introduce them right now, and I just met Anna tonight, but uh, Anna's employed with uh, Samaritan's Purse, and we have a few of our folks uh, that, that I know uh, don't know. I know that's a big place, and you probably don't even know each other, especially with a mask. I, I was coming in Sunday, and uh, a lady came in and said something, asked me a question, and I, I said, uh, I said, you know, I said, uh, I'm going to answer that question. But I said, would you tell, who am I speaking with, please? <laughs> and she told me, and it, she doesn't normally come here. They, they're they part of another church family, but I, they'd slipped in. They're friends of mine, but I, I wasn't expecting, and the lady was by herself, so I didn't know who she was. But a lot of times it's, it's hard just to know, but we want to be much in prayer for uh, our prayer requests and our needs. And I brought some of our leftover uh, prayer lists from uh, Monday morning prayer meeting, and I'll put those out in the foyer after the service. If you'd like to pick up one take with you, you can be praying with us. Our men's prayer group meets uh, Friday morning this week at Neva's Grill over in Mountain City. And uh, if you take the shortcut down Mountaindale here, it's really just only a few minutes. And uh, we're looking to invite all of our men, our band of brothers and men, to come and join us at 8.30. And uh, we're just going to have a very special time. Always good fellowship, good breakfast, good praying, good communication, fellowship together. And then uh, we have uh, our Monday morning prayer meeting is now meeting back here at the church. We met back here for the first time in 14 months uh, this last Monday morning. And uh, just it was so good to get back praying in, in the Lord's house again. And uh, uh, 
I'm just supposing, Miss uh, Angie, that uh, with Sunday school and nursery and all starting this Sunday, that uh, probably our, our children's ministry starting next week, or are y'all waiting till the meals begin? Or oh. Okay, all right. Well, that'll, that'll be good. We'll let everybody be aware that our children's ministry will be up and running. Running. Our youth are still on Wednesday nights. They're still doing Zoom or online uh, chat room, getting together and all like that, and I'm sure they'll probably be back next Wednesday night too. And we're expecting before too long our kitchen to be finished down there and meals will be back again, and that'll... Boy, I miss the I miss the fellowship guys around the table. Don't have I'm not going short of food as you can tell, but I I, I sure miss the fellowship. But anyway, listen, I I wanted to tell you that uh, somebody had told me about uh, Jim, and uh, Jim and Anna Corbett had moved here I think last year from down in Texas. Is that right? And and uh, they've been all over the place. And Jim is a Southern Baptist trained. Uh, uh, minister of music, and he uh, graduated from Baylor, and then from uh, South or uh, from Southern Seminary up in Louisville, and has been serving the Lord in churches all all everywhere. And uh, it's funny how people are. And I was telling him tonight, I, I I had been looking at his paperwork, but when I met him, that boy had been doing his homework on me. I mean, he had studied me, and he knew we were going to be meeting. I knew I was going to be meeting him, but I didn't know anything about him. But uh, So I did some background on, on him this week because we just met last week and uh, and get, getting to know each other, and I just wanted to welcome him to the area and, and uh, find out what he's up to and what he's looking for and what he wants to do and and uh but i found some things in here dj we're gonna have to watch him because one of the things is he put down uh, one of his hobbies and interests was harley davidson motorcycles so i said oh god here's another one of them and uh <laughs> but uh just a lot he he came to know the lord back in 1974 and baptized in a little church out in alabama and uh ordained at a church I bet you've never heard of before, uh, First Baptist Church of Truth or Consequences. Out it, I had heard of the church before, but it's in New Mexico. <laughs> I do what? That'll preach. I was preach. I was going to preach on Sodom and Gomorrah Sunday, but I think I'm going to preach on Truth or Consequences. <laughs> But anyway, uh, one of the things I wanted to share before they come, they're going to minister to us a few minutes now, and then they're going to be back before the service this Sunday, and uh, they're going to be playing just from about 1045 right up till time for the service to begin, just so we can have some music going as people come in. It's going to be a great day, and uh, but uh, I wanted you to get to meet them and I didn't want them walking in on a Sunday morning never been here never seen the platform or know anything about the hookups and didn't want to surprise Carter on Sunday morning but uh, uh, he wrote a philosophy of ministry that having worked with ministers of music all of my adult life I so appreciate this Jim and I truly mean this he wrote here, God has placed a passion within me for helping God's people experience his presence corporately through praise and worship. I believe the primary purpose of all choirs and music programs in the church should be to bring glory and attention to God and to challenge each one of us in our personal spiritual growth. As we testify of the greatness of God, we find ourselves brought to a recognition of any sin in our lives and faced with our need for forgiveness and reconciliation with God. Our deepening love for God and our thankfulness for what Jesus has done in us motivates us to go into all the world to share the good news with others. So I think that just says a world of good, and these guys have been married for a long, long time, and... Uh, his wife is uh, Anna. Has played uh, piano and in churches and all. And I know that you guys will be a jewel for some good church to find. And going to be praying for that with you. And 
And But in the meantime, I'm glad to get to meet you all and to have you with us. So would you give a big welcome tonight to Jim and Anna Corbett. Welcome to North Carolina, guys, and all the best. <laughs> you know, I was noticing um, at the beginning of the service, well, the slide that was up says, when two or more are gathered together in my name, there I am in the midst of them. We know what that means. I mean, how many of y'all are here tonight in the gathered in the name of the Lord? So you know what? <laughs> he's here. He's here with us. You know, and the word tells us that he's moving around. He's moving amongst us. And he's just searching our hearts. And he's just wanting us to draw near to him and to magnify him and to lift up his name. Some of you all may know this song. If you do, don't let my singing it hold you back. Mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Till I lay my head I will sing of the goodness of God All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath that I am able oh, I will sing of the goodness of God Of your voice you have led me through the fire In darkest night You are close like no other I've known you as a father I've known you as a friend Oh, I have lived In the goodness of God And all my life you have been faithful. Thank you, Lord. And all my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able. Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. With my life laid down, I'm surrendered now. Oh, I give you everything. Your goodness is running after, it's running after me. All my life you have been faithful And all my life you have been so, so good With every breath I am able Oh, I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I will sing of the goodness of God I'll sing that with me all my life I, you have been faithful God all my life you have been faithful thank you Lord and all my life 
you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Yes, I will sing of the goodness of God. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. God, you're so good. Yes. God, you're so good. Thank you, Lord. And God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Oh, thank you, Lord. Jim and Anna, thank you all so much. Appreciate you so much being here with us tonight and blessing our hearts tonight. And we just had a good night of singing. And I want you to take your Bibles uh, to the, uh, tonight and join me back where we were Sunday morning uh, in uh, Acts chapter 4. And uh, I will tell you that uh, uh, Sunday is our grand opening day for the church and uh, we're looking forward to a wonderful time, and we're just going to, we got some preliminary uh, information. We're going to hear from our building committee just a little bit of what's happening. We have some special music on Sunday, and then we're going to go in uh, again to the book of Acts and uh, spend some time together there. But uh, I'm, I'm going to, the message on Sunday is the man, is about the man who lied to God. Now, you wouldn't think anybody would lie to God, but as we kind of work through the book of Acts, chapter 5 tells us about a man and his wife who lied to God, and this was right in all the excitement of the early church. So uh, uh, there, I, I found several ways in which men sin against the Holy Spirit, and they're all mentioned in the Scripture and all, but I think for a man to just outright lie to God is really something. Well, in Acts chapter 4, let's just set the kind of the pace again as uh, what had happened. And uh, in Acts chapter 4, as we uh, look at that, it says, And as they spoke unto the people, the priest and captain of the temple and the Sadducees came upon them, being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they laid hands on them and put them in hold or in jail unto the next day, for it was now eventide. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of men w was about 5,000. This was really a time of excitement. They were still reeling from what we talked about a couple of weeks ago about Peter and John going up to the temple and they met the man begging for alms there at the gate of the temple. And uh, uh, he was expecting a gift. And Peter said, well, I don't have any silver or gold, but what I have I'll give to you. In the name of Jesus, rise up and walk. And he took him by the hand and lifted him up. And that began the uproar. And this came right in the aftermath of the resurrection of Christ, his visible appearances over uh, 11 times, over 11 times to different groups of people over 40 days and then out to the Mount of Olives for his ascension into heaven and many of the people who had seen him nailed to the cross and saw him uh, crucified and saw him beaten with a cat of nine tails whip, they also saw him after the resurrection. Man, there was no slowing these guys down. When you, when you stop and think that uh, Jesus had prophesied, he said, there shall no sign be given but the sign of Jonah the prophet, just like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so shall I, the Son of Man, be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. He was talking about his resurrection in three days. Again, Jesus was stopped by people, and he said, tear this temple down, and in three days I will restore it again. Well, they didn't know what he was talking about, and they 
accused him of blasphemy and everything else, but Jesus was talking about he was going to be killed and he was going to be buried, and three days later he was coming out of the grave. He told his disciples around the campfire one night, he said, uh, I am going to be taken away. And he said, I'm going to be found guilty and charged. And he said, I am going to be killed and I'm going to be crucified. And it never sunk in even to his closest followers. So guys, with all of the excitement and with all that was happening, we saw what was happening in the early church. These were exciting days. As a matter of fact, I was reading in J. Vernon McGee, uh, one of his commentaries on church history, and he was talking about the early church here in the book of Acts, and he said Peter and John had been released and uh, returned to the church to give their report. Here we have recorded a great meeting of the early church. I do not believe, he says, that the spiritual condition of the church has ever again been on such a high level as it was then. We find the key to this was their prayer. It is more than a prayer. It is a song of praise. Lord, thou art God. Lord, you are creator. Friend, I am afraid the church is not sure of that today, that the Lord is God. Are you sure that the Lord Jesus is God? Are you? That is most important. The church is not sure today. The church is fumbling. It has lost its power. The church is always talking of methods, always trying this gimmick and that gimmick to attract people. The church in suburbia and the church in downtown are little more than religious clubs. The church is not a powerhouse anymore. The early church was sure that Jesus was God. They refer to the second psalm. I am moved by this. This was a great prayer and praise service in the book of Acts. They were all in one accord. Probably they did not all pray at one time, but they were certainly say amen, were saying amen with the one who led in prayer. Notice that they did not pray for the persecution against them to cease. They prayed for the courage to endure the persecution. They asked for power from God and for boldness to speak. The early church was something different, friend, from the church of our day. Note the power of the early church. When they had prayed, the place where they uh, were shaken, where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. It was the condition of the church which made, which made all of this possible. <clears throat> and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that all of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. Uh, this did not last very long, he, he writes. Carnality came into the church very soon. And with great power, the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all, Acts 4.33. That is the heart, he writes, of gospel preaching. Neither was there any among them that lacked, for as many as were possessors of lands or houses sold them, and they brought them prices of those things that were sold, and they laid them down at the apostles' feet, and distribution was made to every man according as he had need. And Joseph, who by the apostles was surnamed Barnabas, which is being interpreted the son of consolation, a Levite, and out of the country of Cyprus, having land, sold it, and he brought the money, and he laid it at the apostles' feet. This kind of living could be carried out for a short while because of the spiritual condition of the church. Now, church family, I want you to, those of us that are here tonight, I want you to know that this is not impossible. And what he said that he doubt, he doesn't know if it'll ever happen again. It's not an impossible thing. It is just us being willing to listen to, to God and to follow the leader, leadership of the Holy Spirit. It is nonsense to say that we should put this into effect today. If we tried it, we would have utter chaos. Why? Because there must first be the same high spiritual level 
and we don't have that in the church today. Let's be honest, and let's face up to it. We need to come into a closer relationship to the person of Jesus Christ. And so uh, with that in mind, I wanted to uh, uh, look through where we went on Sunday because I was just going down a, a list rather quickly, and I, I don't want to do that to the Word of God. I want to take some moments just to, uh, to, to, to talk about the importance of each one. First of all, it was a time of great response of faith. The Bible says in verse 4 that many believed. As a matter, matter of fact, 5,000 men believed. Now, back in that day and time, a lot of times, they didn't include women and kids in, in the numbers. And we don't, it, it wasn't mentioned on, about the, on the day of Pentecost when 3,000 people were saved and baptized. But uh, it, there was not a division made. So if that was just men or if that was men and women and young people, we don't know. But 3,000 people. Then immediately after that, it's very clear in chapter 4 that 5,000 men got saved. And uh, I want to tell you, that in itself turns a place upside down. It was, it was a time of great response in faith. But here was the key. It was a time of responding to the preaching of of the Word of God. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, look with me over there just a moment. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and uh, down in verse uh, 17 and 18, <clears throat> Paul said this, For Christ did not send me to, or sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of no effect. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. Guys, I want to tell you, I have heard sermons all my life. I've, I've spent more time in church than I think I have probably any, any place else. But I, I want to tell you this. There's a lot of places where I've been that I didn't hear the Word of God preached. <clears throat> I, I've heard a lot of books quoted from, uh, and they were, you know, uh, all kinds of books, all kinds of history, all kinds of uh, in information. But the early church was moved because of the preaching of the gospel. They preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ, and that salvation was by faith and trust in him. Scripture says neither is there salvation in any other? For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved, Acts 4.12. Uh, they made it clear that if a person was going to be saved, it's not by the intelligence of the speaker. It's not by the great, uh, using great big words or having deep wisdom and knowledge in words, but it's simply the preaching of the gospel. And thus in verse 13, it, it alludes to that. It says, and when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, and they understood, they perceived that they were just ignorant and unlearned men. The Bible says they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And so I tell people, you know, leading your family member to Christ, leading your friend to Christ, leading to somebody over a cup of coffee in a restaurant to Christ, leading somebody and uh, you know just a, a tremendous uh, Sunday morning we had a couple of folks that lifted their hand for prayer they don't know for sure if they died tonight they'd go to heaven and 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 I asked people to lift their hands and and I not only did I pray I con made contacts with both of them and going to be meeting with them we've got time set to get together and talk and because i won't tell you that's the most important thing that's all that's what we're here that's bottom line guys it's where the rubber hits the road it's it's where it's what it's the main thing when we say the main thing is to keep the main thing the main thing we don't want to get off on tangents that don't take us anywhere and we don't want to get out out on endless debates that go nowhere I had a uh, contact today, somebody asking me a question, is such and such a sin? And I, I answered that, but it, it was one of those things, it's not what I want to spend my life arguing about things like that. 
Uh, a lot of people know enough about the Bible just to want to argue different things about the Bible. And, guys, it goes so much further and so much deeper. And I got to tell you, I, I had a glorious day the other day. God gave me a, a, a day that uh, I'm having more and more of these things. That, and I'm going to tell you, I'm just, don't, I don't want it to quit, God. Don't stop it. But, I mean, I, I, it is uh, God just opening doors and divine appointments and uh, things happening and th people saying things to me and, that are just the hand of God, and, um, and and I am so grateful and thankful. But there was a preaching; uh, it was great preaching. It was a time of great response of faith, and then number three, it was a time of great commitment to witnessing with conviction. Uh, when we, the best, I think the best story, guys, that you and I, better than memorizing Romans Road, better than getting trained in evangelism explosion, better than all of the things. These are all good things. These are all good things. Steps to peace with God. Uh, this was your life. All kinds of witnessing tools. Can I tell you that I have seen more people come to Christ as you share? Can I just tell you what Jesus Christ means to me in my life? Can I tell you how he saved me? And we, of course, you want to use the scripture, as we mentioned here. It's the word of God. It's the preaching of the cross. It's telling people about the death, burial, and resurrection. And, and that's why we believe in Christ. And we, because with the, nobody else has ever been raised from the dead. All the religious leaders throughout history, they're all dead men's bones. Uh, you know, but we serve a risen Lord and a risen Savior. It was not just a time of great commitment to sharing their faith, but like Andrew went and got Peter and brought him to Jesus. And, uh, and, and like Philip uh, out talking to the Ethiopian man out in the wilderness. And like Jesus stopping and talking with the woman at the well. And like Jesus talking to Zacchaeus, he called him down out of the tree and he said, Come on down, Zacchaeus, I'm heading over to your house. Me and you are going to have a peanut butter sandwich or something easy. But he said, I'm coming over to your house. And, and that day, Jesus said to Zacchaeus, Today salvation has come to this house. Guys, I'm going to tell you what, it's personal relationship. It's talking to people about the Lord. And we had some visitors here Sunday, I had several visitors, and I was uh, out the other night visiting with one of the families. And I'm going to tell you, God didn't open one door, and then another door, and then another door. And, then another, and I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to sit still and look poised, you know, like I always do. But uh, I want to tell you, <laughs> the inside my heart was jumping. I was going all over the place because I, I was just saying inside, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God. And, uh, you know, I won't tell you, when you see God uh, working and moving, you see God speaking in somebody's heart, and you know what's happening. You know, you've been there. You remember what it was like when you didn't know the Lord and you wanted to know him. And uh, uh, I, I love that old chorus, there's a peace in my heart that the world never gave, a peace it cannot take away. Though the trials of life may surround like a cloud, I have a peace that has come here to stay, constantly abiding. Jesus is mine. And so it's sharing. It's a commitment to witnessing with conviction. And in the early church, everybody was trying to tell the people that they love the most in this world, let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done in my heart. And uh, I want to tell you, that pays off, guys. And it does. It's a seed planted, and you can just trust it, God. If, just like farmers out here in Bethel plant a seed, you cover it up. You don't go back and lie in bed at night worrying about that seed out there in the ground. You covered it up, and the ground's cold today and hot tomorrow and cold the next day, and it rains. And, and you, don't, you just commit it over to God. And that's what you do when you plant the seed of the Word of God. You just trust God. Uh, and that's what he wants us to do. It was a time of glorifying God. The Bible said down in verse 21 that uh, all men glorified God for that which was done. Look at the last eight or ten words there. For all men, Acts 4.21, for all men glorified God. What does that mean? It was just people saying down in their soul and their heart, glory be to God. This is a God thing. This is a God thing. 
And uh, it was a time of great boldness and praying. Down in verse 29, uh, he said, uh, And now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thy, thy hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done uh, by the name of thy holy child, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together. Right, let me just tell you a little testimony. Glenn, I don't know if you're watching tonight, Glenn Hills, in a, long, in a hospital a long ways away. He and his little wife came to my church many, many years ago. They were newlyweds, and they started having little kids and all. And they were with us for many, many years, and they moved away. And one of my family members down in Indian Rocks had uh, called me a few weeks ago, and they said, we would need to pray. We need to call everybody to prayer for Glenn because Glenn has a, a brain tumor. And uh, so they were praying that it was one kind of brain tumor. Uh, that was uh, would would be a good kind of brain tumor. Of if, if there is such a thing as a good one, they want this was the one they were. That's what the doctor said he thought it was. But when they went in, it was a melanoma, and uh, and so that's when they called and the, and everybody really began. I was watching as people were coming on board. We're praying. We got we're lifting this up in prayer. They went in and they, they found out, they ran all the tests. They could not find anything else anywhere in his body. All the tests had come back and nothing. Now, guys, I won't tell you that. that uh, uh, two days ago, I got a phone call from one of my former deacons from years and years ago. I remember going to their house asking if their kids could ride the bus to Sunday school and church 50 years ago. And... Uh, and uh, they all got saved, and Howard became a deacon. Howard didn't. He had he had one arm, but he couldn't use it. It was frozen, and the other play he didn't have an arm. And so Howard drove everywhere, and he had a little steering wheel on the uh, on his car, uh, on the on the floorboard. And so he would wear his shoes, and he'd get in his car, and he'd take off his shoe, and then he'd put his foot. Do y'all remember Howard Jordan, uh, Lynn, you and Donna? That was before you guys even. But uh, anyway, uh, he would put it, and I sent him to pick up an evangelist. I had an evangelist coming in at the airport from Alabama, and he needed to get picked up, so I called Howard. He was always good to run errands for me. And when the evangelist got, got back to church, he said, Charlie Martin, he said, I'm going to kill you if it's the last thing I do. I said, why? He said, that guy couldn't, he, he told me he was driving, and he said, I got in his car, and I saw him take his shoe off and put his foot in that little steering wheel on the floor, and uh, he he drove me home, and the way Howard would open his car door, he'd go up, and he'd push the car door with his foot, and it'd pop open, and then when he'd get inside, he'd push it, and it'd bounce back and close, and he'd turn around, put his foot in the steering wheel. He could, he could get around good, but uh, he became one of the, just one of my favorite people, and he shared his faith and everything. His son, son-in-law eventually became our children's pastor for so many years. But he called me two days ago. He said, Charlie, he said, uh, you know, Eve, uh, she passed away just a couple of years ago. And he said, uh, I just, uh, he said, I'm not going to keep you. I just wanted to know, would you, would you uh, do my funeral? And I said, well, I said, if I last longer than you, and it, it, if uh, if you promise me you won't put your funeral on a Saturday, a, a Monday, or a Sunday, I said, I'll commit to doing it. <laughs> and, uh, but I will tell you, Howard was a guy that prayed with me on many occasions, and we saw God work miracles of healing. Now, you know, I, we practice here anointing with oil and prayer for the sick, and I can't heal anybody. But I want to, the Bible says in the book of James 5, he says, Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Let them anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord, and the prayer of faith shall save the sick. If he has committed sins, they will be forgiven him. And confess your faults one to another, and pray one for another that you might be healed, because the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And guys, I want to tell you, uh, God can heal anybody today, and that's what I wrote back to or texted back to Glenn and to his wife. 
And I said, Glenn, God is able to take care of this thing. God can, he's not restricted. He can do anything he's always done. It is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he'll do for you. And God can do anything. This was a time of glorifying God. It was a time of great boldness in praying, and it was a time of great unity. You know, I love it when the church comes together and when we realize the closeness of how God deals with families and how God deals with church families. Because when family, when church families come together, you know, it's, it doesn't mean that we all agree about everything. We don't. And you and your wife and me and my wife and you and your husband, and you, you, you know what I'm talking about. We don't agree on everything. But we have to agree to disagree. But on the fundamentals of our marriage, we've got to be together. And on the fundamentals of our faith in Jesus Christ, we've got to be together on the key matters, the fundamentals of our faith. The Bible is the Word of God without error, totally the Word of God, that uh, Jesus Christ was the Son of God. He is God. He was born of a virgin. He died on a, a sinless death on the cross. He was buried. He rose again physically on the third day. He uh, ascended into heaven uh, later and told his disciples he was coming back. And I believe the Lord's coming back, guys. And I believe the signs of his coming are ever so uh, more today than I have ever seen in my life. I just, I just know we're living in the times before the Lord comes. I don't know how soon it's going to be. But I know I want to be ready, and I, I want to be ready, and I want everybody I love to be ready. And every time I'm talking with my kids, I say, you let me know what you, what you need me to pray for, because I pray for you every morning. I pray for you every day. I say, let me know. But, but I want to tell you the main thing is the main thing. I want to make sure that everybody I know and everybody I love has heard me tell them how they can be saved and how they can know for sure that Jesus is Lord and heaven is home. There was an excitement about that kind of thing. And there was a time of unity. People were helping one another, encouraging one another, loving one another. Well, it was a time of great power in their ministry. And isn't that what, isn't that what the Lord said in Acts 1-8? But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. The power is not anything that we have of ourselves. It's not force feeding. It's not leading horses to water. Uh, and, and, and you can't make them drink. And God doesn't even, God can do anything, and he doesn't make people become a Christian. And I like to tell people, you know, God's a good God. He is so good that even though you have never given him the time of day, even though you never darkened the door of the church, even though you've never accepted him, even though, you know what, he still loves you so much, he sent his son to die on the, you know, it is that important. And, and recognizing the time of power in our lives that we can't save anybody, but God gives to us when the Holy Spirit baptized us into the body of Christ. The moment we were saved, the moment we called on Jesus, the Bible says, uh, Jesus said in the Gospels, him that cometh unto me I will in no wise cast out. Can I tell you, Jesus has never turned anybody away who in simple childlike faith came to him. I was telling a young lady this just the other day, and I said, I want to tell you, you don't have to know everything about everything. But you, you have to know how much God, when you understand how much God loves you and what he did so that you could be saved and so you could go to heaven. And I always want to tell this. I, if I wasn't a pastor, I wouldn't say this to people. But I always feel like I need to say, you know what? It's not coming to this church. It's not being Baptist. That doesn't have anything to do with it. But I will tell you, uh, we just, we just, we, 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 we preach where God sends us. That's what I do. If God took me somewhere else, I'd go. I'm not going to question him. But you don't have to be a this or a that. But I will tell you one thing, you've got to be born again. There's no other way that we can go to heaven. Well, 
I love, and I'm going to close off with this in Romans 5.20. I want to give you a verse. I wrote that because I wanted to leave you guys with this. The Bible says uh, also that grace, great grace was upon them all in uh, the book of Acts down in verse 33, 433, it says, Great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. I wanted to read Romans 5.20 because it says in Romans 5.20, Where sin abounded, the grace of God abounded. Romans chapter 5, verse 20. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound. But where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. I love that old hymn, grace that is greater than all our sin. I got out my hymnal today, and I was just sitting there singing it to myself today at home in my office. Grace that is greater than all my sin. Grace, grace, marvelous grace. The grace of God is so wonderful, isn't it? Because it, 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 it shows to us that just like God says, if you want me to forgive you, you've got to forgive others. Because Jesus said, if you, don't for, if you won't forgive others, I won't forgive you. And what is grace? Grace is uh, unmerited favor, one definition. But it is given to people maybe something they don't deserve just because like God did with us, he gave us something we didn't deserve. There's not anything good in me and you other than the Lord Jesus. Aren't you glad tonight that you know him and, and to know that you know the forgiveness of your sins? Uh, I won't tell you, suicide rates are out of sight. Many of you guys that are watching us on Facebook and YouTube and all, I don't know where all you live or what all's going on in your communities, but I'm going to tell you, every place I go, every place I see, all the things I hear, it is, it is rampant in today's world, people taking their own lives. And I want to tell you, that what is, Jesus said, the thief, the devil, that's, that's, what he's, that's what he does. That's his old plan. He's always worked that plan. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, to kill, and to destroy. But I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. God, thank you, to, thank you tonight for the abundant life that we have in Jesus. God, this has been a great day today. I want to thank you for it. What a joy to get up this morning and just be able to whisper a little opening prayer to you as I got out of bed this morning. This is the day the Lord hath made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Thank you for giving me a choice to choose to have a good day, God. And I thank you that you're the God that causes everything to work together for my good. Thank you, God, for that. Thank you for clean water to drink and fresh air out here in the country to breathe, God. And I thank you for a good cup of coffee this morning. And thank you for friends throughout the day. Thank you for leading in our lives, God. And thank you for the st stories that we've been reading out of the book of Acts about the early church. And, oh, God, you know, Lord, we want to be everything you want us to be. So, God, tonight... Put in our heart and down in our soul, uh, God, that desire that we need. And I think of the words of that old song, while I was praying, somebody touched me. Must have been the hand of the Lord. Thank you for your presence, God. Thank you for the promise you'll never leave us. Thank you for being with us on this beautiful day, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, God bless you guys tonight. Do we have any word from anybody about anything we need to catch up with? All right. Well, let's all be inviting somebody to come and join with us. Our nursery is going to be open, and the children's ministry will be open, and uh, we'll be looking forward here to getting fully open here just real soon.
Glad to have you with us. God bless.